I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and this is Sustainable Hawaii at thinktech.com, streaming live educational and civic engagement on the internet and Oceanic Channel 16. The topic of our show today is community-based biofuels. To discuss the potential for engaging community in our long-term sustainable energy solutions, we're fortunate to have a national industry pioneer in renewable fuels joining us by Skype from her home in Maui. Kelly Takaya King is Vice President and Chief Communications Officer for Pacific Biodiesel Technologies, <coughs> the company that she helped found with her husband, Robert King, in 1996. Pacific Biodiesel's community-based biodiesel model has become a standard for the sustainable renewable fuel industry. Kelly has also been a very active community contributor, <coughs> serving as a board member for numerous local nonprofits as well as the Maui County elected member to the Hawaii State Board of Education for four years. She currently serves as the biofuels expert on the board of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and she's the co-founder of the Sustainable Biodiesel Alliance. Welcome, Kelly. I think we have you hooked up by Skype now. Aloha. Hi, Kristen. Thanks for having me here. Well, I'm delighted to finally get you alone on the show. I know you're often a contributor to different panels. But I think our audience would like to know in a little more detail about what Pacific Biodiesel is doing. In addition to just creating the product, you have so many other things happening. Can you tell us first about the company, uh, its products and services, and then your ancillary activities? Okay, well, um, we are a, a biodiesel company. Biodiesel is a renewable fuel that can displace petroleum diesel, um, actually up to 100%. <coughs> There's a pretty even energy exchange, so you don't really lose energy with biodiesel. And we've been in business for 20 years. We, like we said, pioneered the industry, starting with our little plant on Maui. And now we have a um, biodiesel refinery on the Big Island that um, exceeds all technology for any community-based biofuel production, where we're actually not just processing the biodiesel, but we're refining it. And it's, uh, we like to say it's the highest quality in the nation, but it probably is the highest quality biodiesel in the world <clears throat> with this distillation process. Um, now that we're, um, we're at a, a 5 million gallon production level, we can um, provide fuel for the uh, local utility. The, the HECO contract is um, one of our, our, big, um, our biggest uh, contracts. And um, we provide a lot of fuel for the, the trucking industry, um, some of the boating industry, um, commercial boats, some of the, a lot of backup generation, farm equipment, and, um, and even uh, passenger cars that are diesel. You know, you mentioned providing to um, HECO, to the utility, as well as backup generation. I think one thing uh, people think of you is only as a transportation fuel. Can you elaborate? Yeah, actually, most of our fuel does go to the utilities between uh, Hawaii Electric Company and Maui Electric Company uh, because they have they have large needs. There's a, um, a lot of petroleum that goes into making our electrical energy, and uh, maybe some people don't even know about. So, if you're at home plugging into your plugging your electric car into um, at your house and you don't have uh, PV panels, solar panels, then you're actually um, using more more petroleum. <clears throat> more petroleum has to be brought in to make that electricity. And, uh, and so we can displace uh, petroleum with 100% um, biodiesel, and we, and we actually provide to the, the power plant at Camel Industrial Park a 100% biodiesel. So it's the um, largest power plant in the world running on 100% biodiesel. That's fantastic, and right here on, in Hawaii, I have been buying your biodiesel for our VW Jetta diesel car for years. And so uh, we used to have to go to the actual production plant on Sand Island. And now you, you have been pumping it for years at the 76 station. Um, tell me a little more about your, what you make available on Oahu since the majority of the population of the state is here. They'd like to know how to access it. Okay, well, that's the best. Uh, uh, that's the best station to go to for 100 percent. There are several um, Union 76 stations around the island of Oahu that sell a 20 percent blend called B20, and um, we we have um, delivery to several trucking fleets and operations on Oahu through the petroleum companies. Some of them deliver um, a B20 blend, which is 20 percent biodiesel. There's a company. Um, 
called the Cape Hamilton. It's one of the stevedore companies at a dockside that uses 100% biodiesel in all of their equipment. And they have actually alleviated a lot of the EPA concerns over petroleum spills by going to 100% biodiesel. Um, so we, we, can, we can provide um, through the local deliverers, we can provide um, up to 100% biodiesel for um, large consumer needs, and large uh, um, company needs. Would you just mention a little more about the EPA's concerns about dockside spills and why the 100% obviously is better? Well, because biodiesel is biodegradable, it's non-toxic. Um, if, if you spill it, it's not going to, if you spill it in the ocean, it's not going to kill any birds or fish. And so if you're on the, if you're a dock site and you have a spill, even five gallons of petroleum, it's a, it's a, a pretty major deal. If you have to stop operations, you have to notify the EPA and the Coast Guard. You have to do cleanup. Um, um, there's a special protocol for the cleanup, and then there has to be it has to be inspected to make sure that it didn't seep into the ocean or seep into the ground. Uh, the first time that McKean Hamilton had a, a little spill with biodiesel, they they went through that whole procedure, called in the EPA, and to see what they had to do. And basically, they were just told, "Oh, it's fine. Nothing. There's no problem with it." So that was a huge cost savings um, on yeah. both sides. Right. But it also because obviously the cost gets passed down to the consumer, so any savings on the part of the distributor is going to be huge. That's right. So, so that's um, largely what we do at the Big Island Biodiesel Plant um, is is make that fuel. It's a fuel production, and we're we're working around the clock. We've got um, on the clock ships of guy of of uh, processors, and uh, I believe at this point, 100% of our processing team over there is um, was hired off the Big Island. So we're providing not only just providing jobs, we're providing jobs for local people, being able to train them in a um, technology process that's new to them. But we're also giving jobs to people who are engineers and chemists, went away to get their their degrees and came back and really didn't have anything to do until the biodiesel plant was there. And it's really, it's really rewarding to be able to offer these high-level technology jobs and chemistry jobs and processing jobs to people who otherwise might have to move back to the mainland to get a job in their field. And for our local viewers, will you tell us exactly where that plant is? It looks like it just takes up one block, which isn't very big. Um, yeah, so it's on an acre and a half of land, and it takes up less than half of that, I believe, as far as the actual footprint of the plant. Um, but it's in KL, which is about 10, 15 minutes south of the airport. So it's pretty close to Hilo International. And we, we are really proud of the fact that we put this um, high technology refinery in, you know, nearby a community that was, um, you know, before, before we were there, really didn't offer this type of, um, of family wage earning job, of high technology job. And we're able to, you know, we're kind of industry because we're in the um, shipment industrial, so it's not like we're in a neighborhood. But we are close enough that a lot of the folks that, you know, lived in the area came looking for jobs. And we were able to hire some people that had some really good experience. And how many people are employed at the plant? The total there at that site is about 35 so far. This is with the... Um, some of the trucking that happens over there as well. The total for our company is about 70, and this includes trucking companies on Maui and Oahu um, that pick up the used cooking oil and do goose trap pumping, and also um, all of our administration you know, of, of, on the islands, our, our uh, bookkeeping and our marketing and our accounting is all done on Maui. So there's really a great deal of community members across the state that are participating. As we look at this uh, biodiesel plant picture again. You can imagine all the of the different uh, applications that people need to learn. Where are they being trained? Are you doing the training or is there a partnership with Maui College? You know, we're doing all the most of the training on site, um, but we, uh, we actually just recently partnered with uh, UH Hilo, or, or I'm sorry, Hawaii Community College. It's the community college on the Big Island. Um, they started a program for technology processors. Um, and it's a, it's kind of a, it, it, we hired the first person who graduated from that program and he's doing a great job. Um, it was kind of built around the fact that now there's some place for these people to go to work. And so they were recently at the plant, they did a video with their drone and they did a really nice interview with the young man that we hired out of that program. 
Um, but we're going to see more, I think we're going to see more um, experienced people who um, w will come to us with a pretty good understanding of what we need them to do. And we're probably it's lowering our training level, our training demands a little bit by having this program right there. Well, when we come back from our break, Kelly, I want to talk more about how you're getting the community involved in uh, some of the other activities that you're doing. So we'll be okay. right back. Okay, this is Think Tech Hawaii, and it's Wednesday. Every Wednesday is Energy Wednesday here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. Come and listen to us. And just to show you what I mean, I'm going to ask Sharon to tell us more. Come and see us every Wednesday, as Jay said. And we have people like Jim Albers from HECO here and co-host Ray Starling here every Wednesday. We not only go on Olelo and OC16, but also stream live. So please come visit us, hear about the latest in clean energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here. You got any comment on all this? As important as energy is in all of our lives today, this is a great forum and a great format to vet those issues. So I encourage everybody to listen in and participate. Okay, Ray, what do you think for a close? Well, I, I think this is the greatest show uh, in the energy world here in Hawaii. Uh, you can come here every week, one hour, and catch the latest on what's happening and hear from the people who really know what's going on uh, like Jim Alberts, we appreciate your coming today. Thank you. Ray Starling, Sharon Moriwaki, Jim Alberts, and Jay Fidel here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. 4 to 5 p.m. Wednesday. Aloha. Aloha. Well, Kelly, I know you also have an internship program at Maui Community, or used to be Community College, now Maui College. Yes, we, um, we partner with UH Maui College on the, their internship from their Sustainable Sciences Management Program. And um, on Maui, the internships are project-based. So um, last year, we brought in an intern, and she and we had her partner with um, actual Clean Cities, Honolulu Clean Cities, to develop a um, clean fleet program. They did that in about two and a half months. It was pretty impressive. They put together the program, got people to apply, um, did the assessments and gave out the awards at the end of this two and a half month period. And now this is, will be an ongoing program for Honolulu Clean Cities to, to recognize fleets that are on their own um, going to renewable energy, whether it's um, biodiesel or electric or ethanol or hydrogen. But um, you know, that's, those are the types of projects that we're partnering with uh, UH Maui College on. We have an internship program on the Big Island as well, and that's mainly focused on um, people who want jobs, so it's, it's more like job training to get to whatever position they want. But we're so did, did um, UH Hilo have to actually uh, bring in or train up or develop a new training program in order to accommodate the need at Pacific Biodiesel? Um, UH Hilo? Yeah. Uh, no, no, really, we're just, uh, we're, it's not, the, the partnership with UH Hilo on, in that program is, yeah, they've, they've actually been working with us on the curriculum, but the broader internship program that we have over there for job training is not just limited to folks from UH Hilo. It's just, um, you know, we're willing to bring people in for a period of three months and do some um, training and try to, try to direct them in the right direction, whether they want to be in, in you know, logistics, whether they want to be in actual processing, they want to be in lab work, um, we try to use that period to get them acclimated to the environment that they're in, to the team that they're working with, and to the type of work they want to do. So it's terrific hands-on experience as well as giving young folks a chance to try out a career. That sounds right. terrific. Well, I know another area that you're engaging the community in is actually developing new feedstocks for biofuels. Beyond. Right. Tell us a little about those activities. Okay, well, we always knew there was going to be a ceiling on um, the fats, oils, and greases that we could get from the, the waste um, the, the waste that was generated from the state of Hawaii. And so um, even, I think, 10 or 12 years ago, I started talking about biofuel crops. And of course, back then, people just laughed at me because they said land is too expensive and oil is too cheap. Um, but now we're at a point where, where I think everybody sees that we have to go there. There's a, there's a greater demand for renewable fuels, especially with the climate change issues. 
and we aren't going to get there with all electric and we haven't seen the hydrogen um, fuel economy materialize yet and so we are going to need biofuels um, and we've gotten we've developed a real good relationship with the Waimea community out on the big island we're working on a project with the farmers out there where we're testing um, like tw- I think we did a dozen different plots of sunflower and in the past we've grown sunflower, safflower, camelina and so we've got quite um, quite a, a, an arsenal of different types of um, crops that we can rotate in and out and the idea would be to partner with local farmers do you know to help provide some of the equipment uh, build out the crushing mill so that we have an I think we have a picture of our our, um, our pilot question now that we have erected next to the biodiesel plant, and that's been a great asset in being able to um, to process some of the the demonstration crops. But we want we'd like to get to the point where we have something that's solid inside of a building that's five times as large as that, and where we can do ten to fifteen thousand acres of something like sunflower, safflower. Also have a a line of um, in the question you know, that can do edible oil, mm-hmm. and um, of course the ultimate sustainability would be to provide the to to grow our own safflower sunflower make our own safflower sunflower oil provide that to the restaurants and then get the oil back and process it into biodiesel. And I think, I think that that's a really important point to to point up is that. Uh, you are looking at not just the immediate uh, production of the sunflower oil, and I think we have a slide of that crushing facility, Um, but you're looking at making it a a whole uh, vertically integrated process, right? Can you describe the crushing facility, and and what are you crushing in there besides sunflowers? Well, we can can crush sunflowers, we can crush safflower seeds, Um, we get oil out of that, and then what's left over is a meal, and that would feed into the livestock industry on the island or throughout the states. <clears throat> so, um, what we when we started erecting that uh, first pilot scale um, crushing mill, we actually got calls from the macnut processors on the Big Island. So we started cr- uh, processing the macnut, the waste macnut oils, the coals that, that don't go into their food products, and um, we've come to the point now where. Um, we, we understand more about this, the waste uh, agriculture that's on the island. And the macadamia nut, if we just crush the kernel, the meal that's left over is really high in protein. It's, of course, it's got a, a fantastic flavor and the cows love it. When we started to get into cold pressing the, the kernels, and now we actually um, have a product, um, oil, macadamia nut oil, that we're starting to push out into the market as a, a um, skin oil. Yeah, I think we have a photo of that oil. I want to. Where are you marketing that? Well, it's been it's been slow. We've been we've been marketing it a little bit on the Big Island on Maui. You know, it's not our primary product, but it's a great product. Everybody who tries it loves it. And macadamia nut oil, we found out when we started researching it, has great properties for anti-aging, anti-wrinkle, it's got sun protection, it's got antioxidants, it's really um, one of the closest, one of the oils that's the closest to the uh, sebum that our own bodies make, and so it absorbs really well. So if and you're producing this oil, um, explain where you get the biodiesel from it and how the byproducts are contributing to actually more creation of biodiesel. Well, the, the original the original um, intent was to crush the oil for biodiesel, and that's that's what we would do if we could get if we got an appropriate. And we we, started, we ran the the uh, macadamia nuts and shells through our our expeller press, and um, it wasn't built for hard shell um, nuts like macadamia, and so it was really chewing up the press. So we just started cold pressing just the kernels for this oil, this magnet oil for the skin. But um, macadamia nut, once we get the full-size crushing mill bit built, macadamia nuts, kukui nuts, jatropha seeds, all of those things will be able to go through you know, the, the, um, <clears throat> the full-size um, professional crushing mill. Now, and you the- mentioned the, the issue of uh, agricultural waste, and I want to make sure we address the biggest issue that people have with biodiesel, which is that it is a very... Um, you know, big focus um, on the fuel side, taking away from the production of food. So, how would you address that um, concern that people have with biodiesel production? 
Well, there's really a food and fuel issue. We're not food versus fuel because um, what, they're, what that concern is, has to do with is um, more ag on the agricultural side. And, and when, we, when we get into agricultural um, feed stocks, what we're looking at is providing is when we crush it, the oil can the raw oil can go to the um, the um, biodiesel plant. We can refine some of the oil, and that can go into the restaurants. And then the meal goes into our livestock industry, which is food. Right now, we don't have any um, meal source that's made in the state of Hawaii, and so the bulk of the cattle industry in Hawaii gets shipped off to the mainland to be fattened up. That's the missing link right there. Is that is that meal source? Well, and it's the so, high cost of bringing it in in order to fatten them here, right? So it'd be I, lowering I, that it's cost. Actually, cheaper to ship the to ship the cattle over there. Right, right. Uh, so, so it, and the other thing that you pointed out is that even though you're producing for the restaurants, the restaurants are going to then produce the residual oils and fats for you that you can clean up and put back into our tanks as biodiesel. Right, and and actually, what what the, the ultimate model, the cradle to cradle uh, model, would be to rent the oil to the restaurants at a reduced rate, so they don't even have to pay as much for the oil, and then just take it back afterwards, whatever's left over. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, one of the other things you're doing is teaching people how to um, both plant the crops, reap the crops, crush the crops. So those are all kinds of new job skills in Hawaii. How are you getting people? trained up and manning all of these facilities? Well, we're actually working with some of the local farmers out in Waimea on this, this uh, part of the fuel crop project, which just ended at the end of March. But uh, there have been about 10 or 12 plots over there that the farmers have helped us grow on. And we're all learning together about the inputs, what you know, the water requirements, which are not huge for sunflower, um, the inputs as far as fertilizer, the elevations it will grow at, the wind factor, and, and some people actually loves wind. The more wind it has, the more resistance, um, the stalk um, gets stronger to, to um, shore up against that resistance. And in our model, we would have a, a, a three a tri-value crop. So we would get the oil for the biodiesel and or food, we get the meal for the livestock industry, and then the biomass that's left over could be gasified for electricity. So we would use every bit of the crop um, for either wh whatever it is, if it's sunflower, camelina, um, safflower, or um, or anything else we decide to grow out there. And and the the other part of it that's a really beautiful part of this model is we're we're marketing biodiesel, and it doesn't matter if it's sunflower oil, safflower oil, or camelina, or something else, or trofa, or magnet oil. We have one product that we can market, and we can use all these different feedstocks. And if you look at um, the markets that have been struggling in Hawaii, the macadamia nut market, they mar market macadamias. If, market, if macadamia goes under or has to compete against cheap labor, they have to go do something else. Macadamia nuts are macadamia nuts. Coffee is coffee. Sugar is sugar. So you have, you know, if sugar doesn't work, you have to go find another strategy and a new marketing um, plan. Well, when, so we're going to have to take a short break. But when we come back, I want to talk more about the differential between biodiesel and renewable fuel and the markets for them. Let's look at a more macro level. We'll be right back with Kelly King from Pacific Biodiesel. How are you doing? I'm Gordo the Tech Czar here on Think Tech Hawaii, where we co-host Hibachi Talk, where we talk about technology and bring in all kinds of cool guests. Also, my co-host with me today is Andrew. Andrew, the, Andrew the Security Guy. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii and thanks for watching Hibachi Talk. We also have Angus. Hello there, lad. It's Angus. I bring in all kinds of wee things. Oh, look, you see my lips moving. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hittel, and I host a show, Climate Change Beyond Outrage. In it, we go beyond outrage to look at solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. Join me every Tuesday at 1 o'clock Hawaii Standard Time. See you then. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, we're back with Kelly King and Pacific Biodiesel. And before the break, we were beginning to talk about the larger market for renewable fuels and some of the differences between blends as well as the different renewable fuels. So Kelly, would you talk to us a little bit about why you sell some 100% biodiesel, which I enjoy using, um, and why some are blends? Well, it's really consumer preference. Um, you know, individuals uh, like yourself and, and us and, and most of our customers on Maui who come to our Maui station um, with, in, with passenger cars prefer the 100% biodiesel. The large fleets are sometimes worried because they've been warned against 100% biodiesel from their manufacturer, the engine manufacturers. Um, I think I think a lot of that is owing to the early days of biodiesel when there was a lot of substandard fuel out there and people making it in their backyards or in their kitchen. And so that's a lot of that's carried over. Um, most of the fleets that we deal with that see the the, the, um, the quality of where our fuel has gotten to now um, don't have that fear anymore. <clears throat> but because of the differential of petroleum going way up and way down, um, some of them just prefer to, to stay with B20, especially right now with petroleum so cheap. It's really um, it's really hard to get people up to 100 percent unless they're dedicated to things like the environment, um, something you know, made in Maui or made in Hawaii, and providing local jobs. It really um, it's kind of a holistic attitude to um, to want to stay with B100. Now, what is the difference? I know the biodiesel is is clearly from the bio source from the natural oils and or used cooking oil, meats and vegetable oils. Um, when we talk about renewable fuels, can you remark about some of the differences with biodiesel and other renewable fuels? Well, renewable fuel is an umbrella that covers all of these things like biodiesel is a renewable fuel, ethanol is a renewable fuel, um, hydrogen could be said to be a renewable fuel, biogas is a renewable fuel. So renewable fuel is sort of the umbrella term. But there is a, another term called renewable diesel that you had asked me about before. And renewable diesel is made by a different process. It's actually several different processes. Uh, Biodiesel has actually been through tier one and tier two emission testing um, with the EPA involvement. And renewable diesel has not. So the, the emissions have not been tested on renewable diesel. <laughs> and um, uh, the CARB, the California Air Resource Board, which is one of the strictest uh, regulatory boards in the nation, actually did a seven-year study, and at the end of that study, they came out with a statement that biodiesel is the best um, renewable fuel for greenhouse gas reduction. Now, now renewable, renewable diesel can be made from a variety of products, and it's not always natural origin products, correct? Well, no, it has to be, if it's going to be called renewable, it has to be um, uh, it can't be fossil fuel, but renewable diesel is often blended, um, is, is pretty much only used blended with, with uh, petroleum diesel. Now, one of the other interesting things in the international, national and international market beyond Hawaii is that there is a great deal of interest because of the EPA's requirements um, for renewable fuel standards that we incorporate renewable fuels into our uh, gasoline or, or particularly our transportation fuels um, is that there's developed a trading market in renewable fuels um, proportion in the total proportion of, of gasoline that's marketed and that uh, has developed what's known as the RIN market, the renewable identification number market. Um, it's and a little different. The, I think what you're talking about is carbon credits because that's the national international market. The RIN the RIN um, system, which st RIN stands for Renewable Identification Number, and the RIN system came about as an obligation that the petroleum companies have to support renewable energy, renewable fuels. So the RINs are sold to the petroleum companies. You, can, you have a RIN number for every gallon of fuel you produce, and you can sell those numbers the, the, to the petroleum um, uh, the refineries. Refineries are obligated to buy a certain amount of RINs depending on their production every quarter of the year. So, you know, the RINs go up and down their market base. If there are a lot of people making biodiesel, or, you know, there are RINs for ethanol, and there are RINs for renewable diesel. If there are a lot of people making a lot of fuel, then the RINs go down per gallon. If there, if there aren't that many people making fuel that quarter, and, and the petroleum companies are scrambling to get the RINs, 
because of their obligation, then the rings go up. So it's a very unpredictable um, uh, incentive for the biodiesel industry. We don't know. Sometimes the rims will be at 30 cents a rim. Sometimes they'll be at 70 cents a rim. And it doesn't seem to be terribly predictable. So selling rims, whether you hold it for if you sell them today or hold it for a week and sell them, is it's like being in Las Vegas a little bit. <laughs> so the RIN market is is limited to the United States. It's a it's a U.S. program, right? Thank you. And one of the other elements within the RIN market is that you can separate out RINs and trade them. So, what is the how has that uh, impacted the whole movement towards renewable fuels? And in uh, if people can buy and trade them, much like. You mentioned the carbon credits. Um, the discussion has been about being able to buy and trade them nationally, and the pros and cons of that. What about RINs? How's well, that impacted? Well, we're different in that the, the end buyer has to be a petroleum company. So you do have, I mean, we've seen some companies crop up that will buy them from us and then turn around and sell them to the petroleum company, and they'll take the risk. You know, they'll, they'll come to us and say, I'll give you this much for them today, and and you know, maybe they'll they'll turn around and sell them, or maybe they'll hold on to them for a week because they think the rims are going to go up. So that's the trading part of it. I think that you're talking about is that there's there's a middleman um, layer of uh, businesses that have cropped up around this industry to um, to buy rims from biofuel producers and then sell them at optimum times to the petroleum companies. Can you uh, explain how the rim gets separated from the fuel itself? Well, you know, you can you can you can do either. You can sell the the gallon of fuel with the RINs, um, and then you have to place a value. You have to figure out what that value is at the time that you're selling the fuel, and you can add it on. And then the company you're you're selling it to gets the RINs. For instance, we sell um, we sell fuel to um, Midpac Petroleum, which is now part of HIE. And um, they'll take with the RIN. If they take it with the RINs, they can turn around and sell those RINs to the refinery. Um, if they, if and we, all, we also have customers that we sell fuel to where we keep the RINs, and then we sell the RINs to a RIN trader. Um, and and sometimes we make more that way. Sometimes we don't. It's just it's really hard to say because the market's so fickle. It sounds like that's a whole another industry area that's developing, and perhaps that's going to be a new focus within the finance degree at the University of Hawaii? Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's a, it's a, a Wall Street issue, I think. Very interesting. Now, when you talk about the actual biofeedstock production, are, is that becoming a very competitive uh, market nationally as well as internationally? Um, I know you've done some of the research, early research on Jatropha, um, and you, of course, mentioned sunflower seeds. and uh, Camelina. So is what work is being done outside of the United States on that and are you participating in any of that work? We're not participating in any of the work outside of Hawaii right now, although we do we are developing a partnership with some Sioux Nation tribes in South Dakota. South Dakota already has I think a half a million acres of sunflowers. It's one of the largest um, sunflower states in the it's probably the largest in the in the uh, country. And so what they want to do is um, you know, access some of that sunflower and make it into biodiesel. So we're on the technology side of that partnership. They, they already know how to grow sunflower in a lot of different states here. Um, and and, and a, lot of the, a lot of the research that we're doing is particular to Hawaii because we've never grown these types of field crops before here in large scale. And so getting up to that point where we can understand how our climate affects it, how, how the birds affect it here, how, you know, what kind of diseases or pest issues we might have from these um, crops growing. That's all kind of geographically particular to this state. I know you have a picture of taro here. What are you doing with taro? Well, that's another byproduct. And, you know, we, we talked in the beginning about uh, a little bit, I think, about uh, flexibility and how we how we um, managed to, to stay in business for 20 years. And part of that is, is, being, is having this... Uh, this uh, value-added byproduct acceptance, and where we can look at some of the things that are coming out of our, our byproducts of our process and try to turn those into value-added products. The cool. early process of biodiesel, um, the, the, the waste glycerin that was coming off of that was very crude. Right now, now we're actually processing it, but 
They're very crude. And, and we had a couple of local farmers who, um, who experimented with it in their taro fields and found that it was a great soil amendment. And 20 minutes after they put it in when they flooded their taro fields, uh, the apple snail is floated to the surface upside down. Oh, wow. The apple snail is, um, for people who know about the taro Big problem. Field, the worst problem in the taro field is the apple snail. And they tell me that um, in two weeks, they can undo a year's worth of labor in two weeks. Yeah. Because they're super anxious. What a great discovery. Well, in the last minute that we have, would you just mention the Biofuels, uh, Biodiesel Alliance? and what's happening there because that is going beyond Hawaii. Right, the, it's a national nonprofit that I started with um, the Nelsons, Willie and Annie Nelson and Daryl Hanna, and um, we wanted to give support for community-based biodiesel production for small producers, for folks who are doing it sustainably and correctly because they were really struggling against the, the larger companies and corporations that were taking over our industry. And we, we finally, after seven years, um, we're able to complete the process of, of creating a certification program. So we just recently, last week, um, had a, um, an auditor come out to the Island Biodiesel. We will be the first certified sustainable biodiesel um, plant in the U.S. And that um, was the photo that we just had up, was those certifiers on site. Yeah, and so we're really excited. Um, the New York Times came out for, that, um, for the, the kickoff of that. And um, we're still looking for the article, but I, I think it'll come out soon. Um, but the, the Sustainable Biodiesel Alliance is a, it's a small nonprofit in that we have a, a, a board of people that are from across the country. And we have a staff of two, but we've been working on this certification diligently over the past um, five years. And um, this is a way for people who are doing what we're doing, you know, we feel like we're, we're focusing on sustainability and maybe even it costs us a little bit more, but giving us some value back and then showing our potential customers that uh, we're, we have a whole value chain all the way back to the feedstock and all the way through to distribution. That, that also is stuff. a value chain that you're incorporating a lot of community members in and creating jobs and a lot of uh, science and research and technology and focus on Hawaii. That's so right. Real community-based biodiesel development. Thank you for joining us, Kelly. I'm so glad I finally got you on the show. And I know we'll see you back at ThinkTech a lot in the future. Okay, well, thank you, Kirsten. I really appreciate it. And all the best to you. Aloha. Aloha. We'll see you next Tuesday for Sustainable Hawaii.